Welcome to Wise Up Governance and Boards podcast, brought to you by Three Wise Owls Governance Consultants, covering hot topics in governance, risk, latest regulatory changes, and issues keeping directors and executives awake at night. Here are your hosts, Ainsley Cunningham and Deb Anderson. Welcome to another episode of Wise Up. Today we're joined by Carissa Breen for the second part in our cybersecurity series uh, to cover communications during a data breach. So Carissa Breen, or KB as she's better known, is an entrepreneur and as an ex-techie saw issues with the way the cybersecurity industry was engaging with people. Having worked on the front lines of tech, she founded KBI to help global in- enterprises frame and develop their engagement strategies. Whether marketing, internal communications or PR, KBI is 100% focused on helping tech companies communicate better with their audiences. Welcome, Carissa. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Ainsley and Deb. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I always love this question because I definitely have a random background. So before we started recording, I think Deb asked me where I was from. So ultimately I've been in Sydney 10 years, but I, I am a Queenslander. I was born there and family obviously were cane farmers, but I wanted a shift in scenery. So I moved to Sydney, but I, my career in I didn't really start up until about seven years ago. And that started when I worked for Commonwealth Bank of Australia. I was working not in security then, I was working just in IT in general, but I found a really big interest because I was fascinated as to why people, especially cyber criminals, were doing things and I had a lot of questions around it. I was really, really curious. And then I went up to the CISO and I started asking him all of these questions and he was like, look, no one really at your level asked me the questions that you've been asking. And I think in order to do really well in this industry, you need to be curious and you need to ask questions. And that's sort of when uh, the pivotal moment on my career came when I moved from being in IT into cybersecurity. And my first role there was a reporting analyst. And it was probably from that moment. Now, it wasn't the genesis of why I created KBI, but I started to understand the importance of communications because part of my role there was to write board reports and to talk intelligently around the aspects of cybersecurity and communicate that up to the board. And I started to understand at a fundamental level what the key ingredients were to communicating to that uh, in terms of to people who were not cybersecurity people at all. And then sort of throughout my career, I talk on various roles uh, within the bank and then also moving outside of that into consulting. And I still used to fall back on always being the communicator and being that voice uh, for our super technical people. And I, one of the things that I find really interesting is that everyone always talks about technical capability, but now sort of in the last five years, we're really talking about the communication side of it and those soft skills, which I think are hard skills and are necessary skills to have in this industry to be able to talk to people about such a complex uh, technical topic and to be able to communicate that to people in order to get them to understand why cybersecurity is important, but also to get them to give you money, especially if you're working at the large enterprise level. And so then I went on to create my own company. So when you sort of read my bio out, and I and I still think about that that time when I jumped ship from working in a in a company doing my own thing now, running my own firm for three years is because there's been that gap around the technical and then the business. And I wanted to marry those together. So three years on, we we do work with startups and large enterprises to help them communicate that message. But one of the things that's really interesting that I'm seeing is that lack of communication skills and lack of understanding when people are communicating data breaches. So when you sort of approached me, I was really excited to talk about this because I don't believe a lot of people have this done well and I'd like to perhaps shed some light on it today. Fantastic. So um, I guess in your experience then KB, how would you find um, most organisations are doing it and how can they do it better? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things like when I was reporting is that we would give a bit of a landscape snapshot to to provide executives with what was sort of happening out there. I think there's this fallacy that will never happen to me and it quite often does and then it's this panic of, okay, now what's happened? What do I do next? 
And so then there's that scramble to try to manage it. And then more often than not that I see, people don't manage it very well at all. And then as a result of that, it becomes bad reputation in the market. People don't really trust you anymore. And it's even harder then to sort of rebuild that trust once you've lost it. Yeah, I think a lot of um, businesses overlook um, brand and reputational damage and the impact of that mm-hmm. and the recovery of that, if, if, if it's even possible in some instances. Absolutely. There was, a, uh, there was a study done recently, or maybe recently, a few years ago. It was, it was actually in the United Kingdom and they had interviewed all these people about if a company were breach, were you to go back as a consumer to engage with that company? And I think it was like 70 plus percent of people were like, no. And so that's incredibly concerning because data breaches are happening left, right and centre simply because we predominantly have companies operate on the internet and that's where it starts. And I think that it's something that people do need to be aware of. But again, I think people are so busy with the day to day and trying to, to manage even their own cyber practices and then doing the communication side of it really does fall by the wayside until it happens and then there's sort of, again, last minute scrambling on, well, what do we have to do now and how do we manage it? And communication along the whole sort of journey is important too, isn't it? So even, you know, you have a breach, even if you're still in the early um, stages of investigating that breach, it's important to just communicate and say, look, this has happened, Um, we're investigating it and we'll just keep you informed along the way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things is, well, I mean, we'll probably get into it a little bit later, but the thing is when you are talking about a breach, I think the main thing that I sort of see is people actually communicate too early about what's going on. And I think that's purely because there's a disconnect between the PR or the corporate affairs manager and the actual technical team because perhaps they don't really know what that means. And so they maybe overheard someone and they've misconstrued the information and then all of a sudden they've, they've deployed that into the media and then the media has got a hold of that. And then all of a sudden this story has just sort of uh, created this massive um, impact in terms of people reading it. And then it's just over exaggerated what's actually happened. And so I see that a lot because people are ill-informed and therefore they get a hold of something and then they can write a story on it. So I guess coming from your background, Carissa, let's talk about, um, how you would go through the process. So a company has suffered a data breach, what's sort of the first steps they need to take initially? Look, I think initially, now, every company kind of varies, but if we sort of just use a, I don't know, in terms of a, a very broad stroke approach because this could be applied, I think the main thing is having a bit of a triage, meaning identifying who those key people are in the organisation to respond to communicate and to remediate. I'll be honest with you, most people can't even get to that stage. So when it's like, cool, we've had a breach, and then it's like, okay, well then who who's on the team to be able to do that? So most people are still stuck back there in terms of identifying who those key people are. So once you've done that, it would be in terms of, I would probably look at it as having like six POM streams, and, and I'll get to the reason why that's important. So it would be management, internal staff, suppliers, customers, external stakeholders, and media. And so those are sort of the six streams I like to look at it in because your discourse and how you communicate to each of those streams won't be too much of a difference, but the discourse in which you operate and how you communicate that will be fundamentally a little bit different anyway because they are different types of people that you need to be able to communicate that message. And so once you've identified the team, you've identified the streams of people that need to be across this, you then need to have some type of comms prepared. A lot of the time, people don't even have basic sort of uh, comms frameworks on if we got breached, do we have something that we can get out to people? Because you do need to notify your customers, especially if you are an Australian business and you're turning over more than $3 million per annum and it is being classified as a data breach, you have a, um, uh, a duty of care to respond to the Australian Information Commissioner on that and they will then advise you on what their frameworks are to uh, 
in terms of advising your infected customers. And so once that's sort of been established after that, you need to have a very clear plan on what you intend to do about it and actually going to the incident response team sitting in your cybersecurity practice to derive what the chain of events and how that actually happened. Because again, as I was saying to you earlier, it's very easy to communicate the wrong thing and then all of a sudden the media has a different story. Then you need to be able to talk intelligently to your internal staff about what the whole company needs to do collectively and cohesively to manage that message. The last thing that you really want to be able to do is that some junior developer has heard about what's been going on and then all of a sudden he's speaking to a journalist and it's really misconstrued the message and it really muddies muddies the water and that's something that you want to be able to avoid because it's hard to recover then from a ill-informed message rather than being upfront about what's actually going on. Then once you've sort of constructed all of uh, the messaging, you need to be able to decide who is the person to communicate that message, especially when it comes to external media. And a lot of the things that I've seen, most people, again, don't actually know who that is because it might not be the CEO. Maybe it's the corporate comms lady. Maybe it's the incident response guy. And so I think really understanding who that main person is to communicate that and it needs to stay with that person. Because it's very easy then to chop and change and all of a sudden there's Chinese whispers about what's actually happened. And then again, that's following the plan that you've put in place. How often should we be communicating? What channels should we be communicating? What type of information should we be communicating? And so then you'll obviously need to rinse and repeat that process until there is some type of a resolution. So I guess for businesses who might only be sort of maybe that three mil mark, they do get caught up in the legislation requirements for, um, you know, um, divulging if there's a data breach has happened. But Mm -hmm. they might not be of the size to actually warrant um, a position for a full-time person, a chief security officer, a chief information officer, a PR team or anything like that. So what are the sort of things that a business of that size um, need to do? Like you've sort of touched on some of those points about having, um, you know, crisis comms drafted and things like that already. Um, Yeah. What are the other things that they can do to manage any impact to brand or reputation damage? Look, I think that's a really good question and I think I, that is such a common thing that we do sort of see as well because these companies, they don't have enough budget to hire a whole fully-fledged team. But I think first and foremost, you need to have some form of immediate statement ready to go straight off the bat. doesn't even matter if you think that it will never happen. Chances are it may and it's about being future-proof that if it were to happen, do you have something ready to go then and there? You can't at, at that type of situation, time is so critical that every hour that ticks by and you haven't responded because you don't know uh, who the person is to respond or you don't have anything in place and you're trying to sort of engage with an external PR agency or whatever that may be, have something ready to go just in case because at least you've thought about it because a lot of companies, even at the large size, don't even think about this either and you are coming in more of an an offensive approach. And what I mean by that is instead of sitting there acting defensively when media and all that type of stuff are coming to you, you can say, cool, this is the state of affairs, this is what happened, and this is what we are doing as an organisation to remediate the issue, to really rectify it. Do the OAIC have good resources on their website to help companies when they have a data breach? Sorry, Deb, I just lost you then. What did you say? Sorry. Sorry. Do the OAIC have good resources on their website to help them if you have a data breach incident? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the the bit of feedback that I do hear is that sometimes it can be detailed and people, when they look at it, they just feel really apprehensive about reading like a 60-page document on how to go about it. So um, that would probably be the only thing that I have heard when people are looking government websites that they feel overwhelmed by the information out there. And then as a result of that, they're like, it's too much. I couldn't be bothered sort of sifting through this information. Yeah, absolutely. We all sort of <laughs> information overload, isn't it? So in absolutely. terms of, um, I guess, uh, establishing a core data breach response team, who are the sort of key players? I mean, you've mentioned previously the CEO and maybe a a PR person, but is it worthwhile getting in an external PR agency in this space? 
my thoughts around that would be there's this common failure that I see in the industry as maybe what I touched on earlier is you've got a PR agency. They don't really at a core level understand cybersecurity. And so then there's this gap and that's sort of how I created KBR because there's this gap. And as I said to, as I mentioned earlier, that people out there are communicating the wrong thing. So I'll give you an example. When COVID happened, uh, everyone went on this government website, all of a sudden it's gone down and a, a government representative came out uh, front and centre and said that they had been DDoS. Now, that's actually not what had happened. So he kind of got his facts wrong and then all of a sudden they had to write another statement about, around what, what happened in that event. And I think that because PR, PR agencies haven't worked in cybersecurity and it's very... Uh, nuanced and the language is very particular about what certain elements mean, it becomes hard for them to understand at that fundamental level what that actually means. So you could do that. I would say having a comms person embedded in your incident response team, so in your SOC or security operations centre, for that person to work with the super technical guys to understand what's going on and then to relay that to the business then internally to say, hey, this is actually what all this technical jargon means in layman's terms. So when you're communicating with um, boards and management teams, how do you kind of manage that um, communication conduit so that you're breaking it down in an element that they understand? I really love this question because I think that that's like the, the operative question that everyone keeps asking in this industry. And I think for me personally, how I see a board member, I mean, doing this for a number of years is they're just human beings as well. And they have the same interests that perhaps you and I have, or they have common ground. And I think that using analogies that then are relevant to those people then as well and not sort of speaking so abstractly about a situation and really bringing it down and bringing it back to basic and not being so esoteric around the language that is used. And I think that it's about understanding your board members and what they actually like and then try to use examples and analogies that make sense to them. So if they love surfing on the weekends, then talk more intelligently about that and try to relate it back to them because people relate to people at the end of the days. And then these people really are just human beings. And I think that the reasoning why this industry has not quite gotten that is because they're not people's people. They don't understand human beings. And I think that when people were taking uh, comp sci degrees back in the day, they thought, well, I'm going to do this degree because I don't have to deal with humans because I don't particularly like them or I feel socially awkward, awkward around them. And I think what's sort of come full circle now is I had a, a professor on my podcast recently and she's like, it really gets to me that a lot of these students don't know how to communicate. They can't write presentations. They don't know how to speak to clients. They can't communicate at an executive level. It's because they're not teaching it back in university or colleges and then all of a sudden they've gone throughout their career and IT traditionally operated as an independent silo just on the side but now IT is the backbone of most organizations this day most companies are tech companies and sort of being integrated and now they don't know how to communicate and so what we've had to do as an industry is almost retrofit hey this is how you talk to people this is how you influence people and most people at that senior level who are in cybersecurity are not leaders they've just gotten there by default and so then if you pull a leader in from another part of the business they don't get the security side of it so again there's this massive disconnect that we're seeing and no one seems to be able to look at it holistically like actually you do need to have some technical understanding but the key thing here is to be able to communicate and influence people and I think if we had been better at that fundamentally we, we would be further along but unfortunately we're not and the average caliber of people that go in IT don't like human beings so hopefully in time <laughs> so how do we bridge the gap <laughs> sorry how do we bridge that gap in terms of um, getting IT people to like human beings or <laughs> yeah, robots? Just <laughs> communication, really. Like how, how are we really going to try and bridge the gap between IT teams, uh, senior leadership teams, executives, especially 
um, you know, pre-planning for a data breach, um, like you say, or worst case scenario, a data breach has now occurred and some of these organisations have not been well prepared and how do we really bridge that gap? In terms of the bridging the gap, it's about hiring people from different backgrounds, like people from comms backgrounds that they can teach the technical side of it. And you don't have to be super technical to understand it at that level. And I mean, since I've been doing that, my skills 100% have probably atrophied on that level. But I think it's about understanding from an executive point of view and saying this is really, really important to us as an organisation and then that executive needs to be able to feed that down through the chain because if they're not championing it at the exec level, at the CEO level, then no one else really cares. It's got nothing really to do with them and I think that that's definitely been the the problem that we've seen or I've seen, especially working in a bank, if people at that level don't endorse it, then everyone else, it just sort of falls by the wayside. So I think one of the main challenges, there's quite a few challenges, but one of the main ones is you have a data breach as communicating effectively with your customers, your clients as to what's happened and to have um, the right people on the other end of the phone fielding those calls and having those discussions. What are your tips in doing that really effectively? So as I mentioned before, having that cohesive message. So you don't want it to for the, the message to be diluted or disparate that the executive guy is saying one thing and then the other guy, the developer, is saying another thing. Uh, I think, for example, it would be forming that team and then distilling that message down into what does this actually mean for people who are not from a technical background and putting it in language that they can understand. And then, again, having that centralised person or that team or that call centre that takes those calls because – once you start then chopping and changing the message, people get really, really confused. They get angry on Twitter. They get they can get really sort of that they feel left out. And one of the things that's really important is that no one gets in trouble for having too much communication. Where companies fall down is if people haven't communicated enough about the process. So people might feel like they're annoying people, but people genuinely do want to know what's going on first Well they were breached and then nothing was said, for example, Equifax, that happened. And that is that is the worst sort of uh, approach you can, you can do with say nothing. So I guess where companies do have that in-house team they've, or they've appointed an external PR agency to manage um, consistent messaging, they've got people fielding calls on the other end of the phone of angry customers who's potentially, you know, their information's now out there in the ether and, um, you know, potentially exposing them to risk. Um, what are the sorts of things that uh, businesses can do to manage the impact to their brand damage? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good statement because, as we were mentioning before, once that's sort of done, it is really hard to repair. I think that, one, that's just going to take time. That's definitely not going to happen then overnight. And I think, again, it's about talking through from a communications perspective about what that company is going to do long term and each sort of stage gate around what that actually looks at. And I think the other thing as as well is media train your executives. That was something I was going to mention earlier. It's because I've sat on panels uh, alongside people from large corporations that aren't really good at communicating. And I think that if these people are on the front line around giving this message or perhaps trying to instill trust these people definitely need to have training because journalists are employed to sort of do their job at getting that message and they can ask questions in a way which almost gets you to shoot yourself in the foot because of how they position themselves. And I think there was a really good interview with Jordan Peterson and um, a journalist and she kept putting words in his mouth but how he recovered from that was really, really interesting. And that's sort of something I haven't seen a lot of in Australia. In the US, their executives are a little bit more um, well-versed at media training, but definitely in Australia, they need to be because, again, you need to be the person at the coal face providing the comms, but also trying to bring back that trust in over time. And I would say that that's going to take time, but, again, it's going to be having a, a level of integrity. So do as you say that you're going to be able to do. I think it's about being empathetic too, isn't it? 
No, you're absolutely right. And I think the other thing is as well is don't try to cover up what had happened. I think just owning it and saying this is what happened. However, this is what we are going to do as an organization to remediate that. And I think one of the things that I found interesting was Barack Obama got asked in an interview like, hey, were you smoking weed? And he just owned it. He doesn't have anything to hide then after that. If you're saying like, no, that didn't happen, and then you're trying to sort of position something else, you get really defensive and it's obvious then when you're lying. And I think that once it's out in the open, all you can do is go up from there. But if you're trying to be very evasive about it, it actually can do more damage because, again, it's coming back to that integrity piece. So in terms of, I guess, some of the other things that you have seen businesses do in this regard, I mean... You know, like some of the banks, they might offer, um, you know, a token uh, credit to people's accounts or um, other businesses might offer a gift voucher or something like that to kind of soften the blow. Um, where they've done – where there's been businesses that have kind of, um, you know, tried to win back the trust, they've regained their customers um, and then – it's gone and happened again. We've seen some really large organisations in Australia um, have repeat offences in this space. Um, what's the recovery look like for those brands? Yeah, I think, again, Australia is a very trusting nation. So when household sort of brand names, this does happen again, it's really, really hard to be able to recover from that. Again, it's probably going to come down to... Uh, the CEO running this at the coalface around having that level. I don't want to keep going back to it, but yes, having that level of integrity, but again, being very open about what's happened and having a plan in place, saying nothing or not communicating the facts is the worst thing. And I think that there's no real, this is the way to do it because it would depend on each individual scenario. But as I said, that like I, not enough people are just being honest about the situation and saying we really care about you guys and having more uh, chains of communication. I think even at the moment, like with everything that's going on with Twitter, like they've got a dedicated support page so people can get upset, but they are responding to people quickly because people hate to feel that they aren't heard. And I think that when you're dealing with a, a breach or an incident, you need to be really quick to be able to respond to these people so they feel heard. And generally, if you continuously try to do that and you are putting mechanisms in place to better the brand, over time that should sort of soften the blow. But again, it's once the sort of damage is done, it is really hard, but you need to be able to future-proof perhaps what that's going to look like. And actually, while thinking of it, Red Cross... They how they sort of managed their breach, they, they still wanted to engender trust so people continued to donate blood and that's exactly what had happened. So I think that was a really good way to look at it then as well in terms of uh, a way that companies have managed breach, breaches effectively. And North Hydro was an aluminium company. They had a massive breach, but how they communicated it and handled it, their share price went up. So, again, those are kind of rare but there, there are good sort of test cases out there around how a company has managed it effectively and that have sort of come full circle then. And I think people are forgiving in the sense of, okay, yes, they sort of stuffed up, but they've been really proactive in their approach, their comms and their, um, their level of integrity to be able to manage that moving forward. So with the threshold for a reportable breach, it still doesn't really take away from businesses of all sizes, they still can have a data breach. It's, it's really the same systems and processes in place. You're just not reporting to the OAIC, correct? Yeah, that would depend. So in terms of like regulated industries, so like fin services and health, there definitely are more regulation around that. And I think that's a good thing simply because people's backs are against the wall and they feel, well, I've got to uh, be compliant and that sort of gets them to think about security. But other industries that are not heavily regulated, not necessarily. And so that then becomes the downfall because they're not being monitored. It means that perhaps they're not considering security because nothing's necessarily going to happen. They're not going to lose their license or anything like that. So to some degree, that's why I like regulation and compliance for those reasons. And 
I think over time they'll try to uh, span across more industries that I've been speaking to people on my own podcast. But again, it's just going to take time because when you think about the internet, like the, when you have a driver's license, like you have rules and regulations that you sort of abide by, but on the internet, it doesn't really work like that. And I think the cybersecurity industry is constantly just trying to play catch up with what's going on. So when they, when you talk about future proofing, having comms, it just feels overwhelming to a lot of people. So you talked um, briefly before about having those six different silos and different types of messaging. Um, can you give us an example of, you know, um, an internal communication versus an external communication and what sort of messaging you would be giving to um, sort of staff as your internal stakeholders? I think we're an internal and that's going to be dependent on how you, you, you do want to be honest, but then you don't want to be so honest in the fact that some guy goes home and tells his wife and his wife knows a journalist at the media uh, company for for example. So I think just being very clear and concise and being um, honest about what happened and what the organisation is going to do about that and what that individual then needs to do, like what's their sort of participation in it. So it could be if you get phoned up by a journalist, don't answer their call and just say, look, I'm not the right person to speak to, but Sally, who's the corporate uh, comms manager, she can funnel your call or we do have a a, our, our hotline number that you can call up in terms of understanding uh, a little bit more about what that actually means. And so in terms of the media side of things, that uh, is always a very interesting one because it, sometimes it doesn't really matter what you say, that they'll misconstrue the information and then start writing a, a headline about something. But again, it's about being honest. You can't be evasive about the situation and then saying, hey, we do have a plan and this is what we intend to do about it. And being just very short and concise. You don't have to be super detailed. And I think just doing daily updates on your social media accounts around this is what we are doing. And if you have further concerns, please call this number and our team who have been trained internally to be able to respond effectively. And how do you manage that, um, I guess, the lag time between one, identifying that a breach may have occurred and to the point where we've now got a handle on that information and we understand um, how it's been, how people have been impacted, what sort of information may have been leaked, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes there's quite a lengthy delay between those two points because it can take some time to identify and kind of track where information may have um, potentially been leaked. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like there are statistics that some companies won't even know that they've been breached until like 200 days or something ridiculous. Um, so it, it is really, really hard to tell. But I think that as soon as you know something, you need to be able to have that triage meeting, bring in the appropriate people to say, okay, what's going on and how are we going to be able to manage this? And I think what companies should start to do is have that playbook in place, have some type of framework in place about what actually happens and I think Ainsley, how you and I met originally, was on that uh, BCP sort of webinar um, and that was um, really interesting because the same type of concepts do apply to this um, and, and knowing like, well, what do we do now? And I still don't think a lot of people have really nailed this, but I think that, again, having some type of communication straight off the bat to be able to send out to people is what you need to be able to do. And it, again, it doesn't need to be an essay. It just needs to be this is the thing that's happened. This is what we're going to be able to do about it and have that sort of bullet pointed or, um, or, or one sort of one, two, three around this is what we're going to be able to do and then when they're going to be able to hear more communications from you. So if it's daily, make sure it's daily. Don't say daily and then it's weekly. Again, like that will then lose trust in people because you're not doing as you say you're going to be doing. So have you got any statistics about generally how long the whole process takes from the time of the... No, not really. Oh, there must have been a lag there. Sorry, sorry, Dave. I must have cut. No, it's right. You go. <laughs> uh, not specifically. Again, it's going to really depend on the industry. So, if they are regulated, that could be longer because they have to go through the whole process. They have to audit what's going on. Um, but no, I don't have any statistics on hand, unfortunately. So, um, before we wrap up today, Carissa, is there some top three tips that you'd like to leave businesses with in terms of um, your skill set and you know, 
the benefit of hindsight in some of these scenarios? I think having a playbook, so having some type of basic framework around if something were to happen, do you have comms that you can send out then and there? I think if it does happen, be honest. Don't try to cover it up. Don't try to lie about it. Be, be real about the situation. And then number three, really identify who those people are in the organisation and then then start to test or war game the situation as well. I don't think I, I touched on that, but again, when these sort of things happen, people feel really stressed and they feel overwhelmed and they don't know how to manage it. So you, I, I would say probably every six months go through, if we were to be breached, how would we as an organisation manage this? And because last thing that you really want to be able to do is know that you don't have that confidence in your staff to be able to respond effectively. Great tips. Yes, absolutely. Get your war game on. <laughs> Thank you. Really appreciate you guys having me today. No worries. Thank you so thank much you. to all our listeners for joining in today. And thank you so much, Carissa, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. That's all for today. Until next time, happy podcasting. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, check out our other episodes and all things governance at www.threewiseowls.com.au.